Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is coming to us from Philippians 3 and starting at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. It's hard to believe that this year has just about ended, and we're going to start another one. Our thoughts are turning from shopping, wrapping, decorating, and getting prepared for the big meal to new beginnings, renewal, and fresh starts. We begin to make those infamous New Year's resolutions. You know the ones. The promises we make to change things or do things differently are to do things that we think we should, that we haven't done yet, that might last for maybe a week, perhaps a month. I learned on CBC News website the other day that 46% of all resolutions are kept until the summer. And yes, a few manage to get kept throughout the year. As Christians, some of our resolutions may be to pray more, read more of the Bible. There are many resources online that are available with plans on how to read the Bible through in one year, etc. To getting more involved in church activities and doing more for people. Perhaps we'll resolve to spend more time in devotions and to listen more intently to his voice speaking to us. The Bible itself does not speak for or against the concept of New Year's resolutions. The practice of making New Year's resolutions dates back over 3,000 years to the ancient Babylonians. There is just something about the start of a new year that gives us the feeling of a fresh start and a new beginning. In reality, There is no difference between December 31st and January 1st. Nothing mystical occurs at midnight on December 31st. By far, one of the most common New Year's resolutions is to lose weight, in conjunction with exercising more and eating healthier. These are all good goals to set. However, 1 Timothy 4 and 8 instructs us to keep exercise in perspective. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The vast majority of New Year's resolutions, even among Christians, are in relation to physical things. This should not be. As Christians, we should also be concentrating on our spiritual lives as well. Many Christians make New Year's resolutions to pray more, to read the Bible every day, and to attend church more regularly. These are all fantastic goals. However, these New Year's resolutions fail just as often as the non-spiritual resolutions, because there is no power in a New Year's resolution. Resolving to start or stop doing certain activity has no value unless there is proper motivation for stopping or starting that activity. For example, Why do you want to read the Bible every day? Is it to honor God and grow spiritually? Or is it because you have heard it is just a good thing to do? Why do you want to lose weight? Is it to honor God with your body? Or is it for vanity to honor yourself? Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And John 15 and 5 declares, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If God is the center of your New Year's resolution, it has a chance for success, depending on your commitment to it. If God's will is for something to be fulfilled, he will enable you to fulfill it. If a resolution is not God-honoring or is not in agreement with God's word, we will not receive God's help in fulfilling the resolution. So what sorts of New Year's resolutions should Christians make? Well, here are some suggestions. One, we can pray for wisdom in regards to what resolutions, if any, he would have us make. Two, we could pray for wisdom as to fulfill the goal God gives you. Three, we can rely on God's strength to help you. Four, find an accountability partner who will help you and encourage you. Five, don't become discouraged with occasional failures. Instead, allow them to motivate you further. Six, don't become proud or vain, but give God the glory. Psalm 37, verses 5 and 6 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. When preparing for this sermon, I checked out many online articles for suggestions on what to speak on. One of the articles I came across was by James Pereira, who is a Christian pharmaceutical executive and researcher and is an expert on Christian healthy living. In the article, simply entitled Christian New Year's Resolutions, he starts off by saying, There are many of us who over the years have ambitiously embarked on a courageous New Year's resolution to accomplish. I am sure by now many of us would have thought about or even have decided on a resolution to achieve something in the New Year. This article is meant to give insight into Christian New Year's resolutions we could reflect on and adopt. He goes on to say, It also shouldn't come as a surprise to us that a majority of us would have abandoned and even seen failure with resolutions by the end of January. In fact, research indicates that 80% of us would have broken our resolve by January 31st. Sadly, only 5% of us would have continued to see through the resolution by year end. So as you can see, the CBC and Mr. Pereira differ on the longevity of our resolve. He continues to say, at the end of the day, when we prepare our New Year's resolutions, we are half-hearted about it. He proceeds to diagnose what some of the causes for the failures are to keep our resolutions and suggests that we follow the SMART method of coming up with the resolutions, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time-Bound. Another article I came across had a number of questions for us as Christians to consider when thinking about resolutions. Questions such as, how much time did I spend in God's word? How consistent was I in my prayer life? Did my witness help bring anybody to Jesus? Did my giving reflect my heart for God? And was worship a priority? As people of God and salvationists, We have an important responsibility toward those in the world. Matthew 5.13-16 to tells us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In short, we need to think, another year has gone by. Have we made good use of the time the Lord has given us, or have we wasted it? It is likely that all of us, in some degree, have not made good use of the past year. But at this point, let us apply the words of Paul in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One of the other articles I read simply suggested that the only thing we truly need this year is to get closer to God to grow in the love of our Savior, and to carry out his will for our lives. That will carry us through no matter what the river of time may bring our way. This article was based on Psalm 31, which in itself is almost entirely a prayer which asks God to be our refuge and to redeem us. The final reading I came across is from the Founder. It is an excerpt from the book of collected writings and spoken words from both William and Catherine Booth entitled, They Said It and it is simply called Resolutions. General Booth says the following, I do promise, my God helping, firstly, 
that I will rise every morning sufficiently early, say 20 minutes before 7 o'clock, to wash, dress, and have a few minutes, not less than five, in private prayer. Secondly, that I will, as much as possible, avoid all that babbling and idle talking in which I have lately so sinfully indulged. Thirdly, that I will endeavor in my conduct and deportment before the world, and to my fellow servants especially, to conduct myself as a humble, meek, and zealous follower of the bleeding lamb, and by serious conversation and warning, endeavor to lead them to think of their immortal souls. Fourthly, that I will read not less than four chapters in God's word every day. Fifthly, that I will strive to live closer to God and to seek after holiness of heart and leave providential events with God. Sixthly, that I will read over this every day or at least twice a week. God help me, enable me to cultivate a spirit of self-denial and yield myself a prisoner to the Redeemer of the world. Amen and amen. He goes on to say, I feel in my own weakness, and without God's help, I shall not keep these resolutions a day. The Lord have mercy upon my guilty soul. I claim the blood, yes, oh yes, Jesus died for me. To live, to love, to serve my Savior, and meet his glad well done at the finish of the fight is my highest ambition. So in conclusion... I would like to leave you with this challenge, which is also from the founder, which is found in his writing, Salvation Soldiery. We are a salvation people. It is our specialty. Getting saved and keeping saved, and then getting someone else saved, and then getting saved ourselves more and more until full salvation on earth makes the heaven within, which is fully perfected by the full salvation without. We believe the world needs it. If you have not yet received your salvation, the time is now. Do not let the time pass you by. The mercy seat is here for you. If you're struggling or you want a more full salvation, the time is also now. The mercy seat is here for you too. Perhaps there is a struggle you have, and it's time to bring it to the throne in prayer. If he is speaking to you, take that step and come forward and begin the new year on the right foot.